Welcome to Concussion Talk Podcast. My name is Nick Mercer. My guest today, Dr. E. Valera, is Associate Professor in Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. She is also a research scientist at Massachusetts General Hospital, and she is Director of Valera Labs. First, however, I would like to thank my sponsor, Head Check Health, who has been my sponsor for the past three years. So thank you again. Head Check Health bridges gaps in concussion care through a simple and powerful technology. Join organizations like the Canadian Football League, Track Factor Racing, the Canadian Junior Hockey League, Eastern Washington University, and a volleyball Canada. Rely on Head Check to improve communication and optimize care. Visit HeadCheckHealth.com for more. Please subscribe, rate, review, wherever you get podcasts. So, Good Pods, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever else you may find podcasts. And please help us support this show by visiting the advertisers on my website, which is concussiontalk.com. Dr. Vlair and I will talk about traumatic brain injuries resulting from intimate partner violence. So, without further ado, here is Dr. Vlair. Hi, I'm with uh, Dr. E. Valera now, and she is, as I mentioned before, she's associate professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, and uh, studying mostly interested, interested in traumatic brain injury really caused by environmental violence. So, partner partner induced traumatic brain injury um, caused traumatic brain injury, say. Um, but first, I should also say the ADD, ADHD in the study of the protocol cortico. Cerebellar, cerebellar, or cerebellum, critical cerebellum, and uh, but uh, that's just that's just the point really for this podcast. Obviously, it's obviously uh, focused on traumatic brain injury. Um, so I'd like to ask it, Dr. Valera, thank you, thank you so much for being on this podcast, and also, uh, I guess to get started, your research interest in how and when, when and how, where you are in that, where in your research are you in newer right now? So thanks, thanks for having me. I think it's a great opportunity whenever I can to share this information because yeah. most people are pretty unaware of, you know, not only that this happens, but the, you know, frequency of it and how that happens a lot. Um, and a lot of people are experiencing not only partner violence, but brain injuries from partner violence. So thanks yes. for providing the opportunity to share this information. Um, so, so, I mean, I started looking at this, the question came to me, I mean, a little over 25 years ago, I guess, when I was working um, in a shelter and also studying psychology and neuropsychology. So where we look at brain behavior relationships and we start learning about brain injuries. And if you have brain injuries, you may have symptoms of depression or symptoms, uh, you know, basically the host of cognitive, emotional, somatic symptoms that we often see post concussions or post post brain injuries. And so as I was doing, learning that in my schoolwork and volunteering at a shelter, I realized that a lot of the women who I might interact with had these problems. And there are also, you know, clearly reporting things that had happened to them that would potentially result in a brain injury, yeah. like getting hit in the head with a baseball bat or thrown out a window or having yeah. their head slammed against uh, a window of a car. Yeah. So so I was wondering, wow, what do we know about the brain injuries in these women? And when I looked, there was absolutely no data in the field. Um, you know, nothing came up with a, yeah. with a lit search. And so I basically decided I was going to try to do it for my dissertation. And uh I did, <laughs> and it wasn't necessarily always easy, but um, no. yeah, so ultimately that dissertation, you know, basically indicated that indeed my hypotheses were correct and that women were sustaining. I was actually a little surprised at how high the numbers were because we found a very high rate of brain injuries. Um, in that particular study, it was 74% of women had sustained at least one brain injury from their partner. And about half of them had sustained repetitive brain injuries from their partners. Oh, wow. So the numbers are pretty staggering. And then we're also able to see associations between the, we made sort of a brain injury score, so to speak, between the number, recency, and severity of brain injuries. 
and how they performed on certain cognitive and psychological tests. So basically, women with more brain injuries and more recent brain injuries had poor performance on tasks of memory and learning and cognitive flexibility. And they also had higher rates of a host of psychological outcomes, including depression, anxiety, worry, PTSD, symptomatology. Right. So this just furthered my interest in learning more about what was going on here. Um, and, you know, basically wanted to keep working in the field. Yeah, I'm sure because it's a, it's a very important subject because I know actually I was going to say the main, one of the not knowing your I'm not your main, but one of your biggest challenges must be the stigma or a stigma around brain injury or neuropathic violence around even the symptoms like anxiety or depression. People don't want to talk about any of that stuff. So, and I know I'm just me doing this podcast. I mean, and I mean, I'm just trying to raise awareness for brain injury in my in my province here in Canada. That's I mean, it's anywhere really. It's just hard to get people to talk about brain injury, let alone in their partner violence or domestic violence. People may, may know of that. And it's a different, it's different one, all more inclusive term in partner violence is. But, uh, but still, but I mean, so did you have you found that there's has there been a, enough, like much, not enough, but much reception for your work, your research? So you're, I mean, you're absolutely correct that the stigma is tremendous. There's yeah. so many different reasons women who have experienced, you know, or the women I'm studying um, yeah. may, may feel stigma. And you're right. The, the, well, if they've recognized they've had a brain injury, because some don't necessarily recognize yeah, that because that's not always obvious, especially with these quote unquote mild traumatic brain yeah. injuries or what we refer to as a potential acquired brain injury from strangulation related alterations in consciousness. Yeah. So women don't necessarily even realize that they may have cysts in the brain, but if they did, then that's, as you say, that can be stigmatizing. And then in the partner violence itself, it can be, people might be embarrassed. Maybe they think it's their fault. They'll be judged. Yeah. And honestly, they are often. Yeah. You know, women who experience partner violence are not perceived appropriately, I would say by a majority of the population. And there's really strong misunderstandings of, of sort of what's going on and sort of like, why do they stay or why don't they just leave? And, yeah. and that's a whole nother question, you know, which we could go on forever, but that's something that's absolutely the wrong question to ask because yeah. women actually are at most risk of being murdered either when they're planning to leave or after they've left and women, the number one cause of murder for women um, it, for homicide is partner violence. So it's not a trivial thing. And no. if your partner is threatened to kill you, so that's just, I mean, I could go on for about that, yeah. but you're right about the stigma. It's, it's tremendous. And there's other things as well. And so, uh, you know, when I, um, that study, I, I was the first study I was pretty lucky with because I was already sort of in you know, the, the shelter people knew me. So I wasn't sort of this outsider coming in that they right. had to worry about if they could trust me. And so that helped quite a bit there. And this, the, and, you know, and other studies that I've done, it has taken longer to get people to come into the study. Um, but then once people came in, if they were able to share with others, they'll be like, oh yeah, this wasn't bad. This was good. And so, so it's not definitely not always easy um, to do this work and to have people participate. Um, and then in terms of funding, yeah, that wasn't, yeah. there wasn't a lab I could go to because people weren't doing this work. Um, you know, when I did my, my dissertation, there were actually a couple of other people who were doing it, but you wouldn't necessarily know they were because they hadn't published yet. Like we, we sort of came out with studies at around the same time, um, but still extremely little work in the area. So, you know, not like, you know, certain things where, you know, you, there's several labs you can choose from doing that work. Um, so, so anyway, so yeah, so it was not always easy, um, and it did require patience in terms of, you know, just saying, okay, somebody's going to, somebody's going to come through the door eventually. And, yeah, and, yeah. and so it's, so, so it has, it has worked out, um, largely. And now the field, I think is at a bit of a turning point where we're finally having not just, you know, like I can name every person in the field where it's like, we're getting other people where I'll go to a conference and I'll be like, oh, hi, yeah. And I, and I meet them and it's a new person who's doing this work, which is yeah. truly wonderful. It's still not anywhere near it needs to be. 
where near is be, but um, we are gaining traction, which I am tremendously grateful for. Yeah, no, I, I sent you, I did, uh, did a podcast last year or two years ago in January about uh, about independent events, and it was in, it was in Canada, mostly Canadian, but there was my friend from Utah, who's a, a staff physiotherapist, the DPT, Lauren Zacks, and, uh, and we talked about independent events in both Canada and in the U.S., and hopefully it'll, well, you know, I hope I don't know how to say this correctly, but that would think that the information will, will be imparted to the rest of the world. But I mean, hopefully, you know, there is obviously, so it's not really, not saying anything crazy here, but it's just, it's just that it's, it's, it's unfortunate that it's such a, so do you, do you find, I know, because you're also a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, Medical School. So do you, do you impart, do, do you talk to the, uh, the upcoming students, the new students or psychiatrists, residents, psychiatrists? Do you talk to residents side as well, or just the the? Uh, I'll, I mean, well, I talk to anyone I can, but I'm not yeah. I'm not someone who's in a supervisory position for yeah. like the upcoming psychiatrist. But yeah. I think this is something that absolutely should be part of the curriculum. Yeah, not only partner violence, but you know, just brain injury more in general. I don't think it's yeah. covered as well as it should. Um, so, so I, you know, I do talk to anybody if I get invited to, but I'm, I'm not in a, I'm, you know, basically I'm a researcher at Harvard Medical right. School. So I'm not really okay. training, you know, involved with the training of, of the psychiatric, psychiatry residents. So, but if, if you were going to, I know you're, you know, I, th I thought you may be more researcher, but, uh, cause I was read to read some of your, your, your publications, not in read, but like the read some of, probably that there were, yeah, publications, but, um, would you say there is any one symptom that is prominent of the people who have suffered, or would you say some of the suffered in environment of violence cause brain injury, or would you say it's more about it just it's a brain injury? So there's the student, everyone is unique, and it's still to help. Because I want to, I want to think people want to know, and I don't know what it makes mental health be a a big a big concern, like such as just anxiety and depression. But uh, the worst, that's just being big and it does subjects. So, yeah, I think, I mean, that's a great question. I don't think, I think it is pretty heterogeneous from what I've seen. Yeah. If, if I, you know, on occasion, I've tried to look to see what are the most common post concussive symptoms they've reported or like what, you know, who's reported, you know, like if out of, you know, 100 people, how many reported, you know, headaches or whatever. Um, and so there are some things that, you know, are commonly reported and I'd have to look to see which ones were the most headaches is definitely one of them. Um, but certainly things there's when we, the other, the other thing to ask about is how far away are people from the brain injuries? And if that makes a difference, yeah. because some of the people were pretty close and some people are further out. So there's one woman who actually wasn't in my studies, but she reached out to me because she saw my work and she was just like, oh my gosh, I think this is what my problem is because I've been in a really healthy relationship for so long, but I still kind of have panic attacks. I feel like I'm dementing at the age of like her mid forties. And she said oh, all these issues. And she's like, I don't understand because I'm in a great relationship. And then she, you know, when you hear her story, she had, you know, a history of repetitive brain injuries and strength, yeah. you know, both from strangulation and hits to the head. And so can we prove that those are contributing to her later negative outcomes? No, but no. is it extremely likely? Yes. I mean, if yeah. you just look at, if we borrow from the sports world and what's going on there, and we know that if you have one brain injury, it's often the case that you'll recover fairly well. But when women are sustaining repetitive brain injuries to the point that's like too many to count yeah. because it was just like once a week for years or something like that you know, then, yeah, I mean, what's the likelihood that's going to fully resolve, you know, right? right. So, yeah. so, so people do have a, a host of different things. Um, and for many of these people, the, the symptoms do persist. And if they're still in the relationship, certainly they may have symptoms of PTSD that are both from just being in this horribly abusive relationship and maybe from brain injury. So some of that is inextric inextricable. Um, but but yeah, so I, I don't know if there's a single yeah. one characteristic that I would say we right. might see. Yeah. But certainly if if you just look, I mean, one of the, my some of my most recent data 
I just found as then a sample of women who weren't, um, I, I wasn't recruiting from a shelter. And the most recent brain injury out of any of these women was six, six months ago. And yet there was an association between number of brain injuries, number of partner inflicted brain injuries and a measure of balance. Really? So, so that, I mean, I haven't published that yet because yeah. we're just basically looking at yeah. those data now, yeah. um, you know, but, but that's just like one example of something that we haven't really looked at before. But when I, when women have come out of the blue, sort of, they've reached out to me and said, oh my gosh, I think I recognize myself in your work. Yeah. And then I, you know, sometimes they would tell me their symptoms and stuff. And I just noticed that balance was one of them that kind of that happened a few times. And I said, hmm, well, yeah. we know that in the sports field, sometimes they, they yeah. measure balance and stuff. So I said, let's yeah. see what we find here. And yeah. lo and behold, it seems to be something that, yeah, is indeed affected. Maybe, maybe more, more long, at least longer term. It's not immediate. That's the thing with diagnosis, again, the heart balance and traumatic brain injury is difficult to, because underreporting is obviously the more the, the, the most challenging thing you find. And also people and people in print, that's for you know, our intimate partner balance. And for you, and for also for your, for your research, it's a traumatic brain injury. People just not recognize the symptoms. So, and people not appreciating the symptoms. So even if, say, someone goes into hospital with a uh, Headache, headache, and they have like a obviously a bruise or a laceration or skull. People, people don't necessarily go straight to brain injury or congestive symptoms, or you or you have to be acting this way because you have a concussion or because you're you're fatigued and blah blah blah. blah. So it's difficult because even for people, people who would report to you, so you find people who report to you are ways often ways from their brain injury, from their they in their, their their relationship. That caused the environmental violence, or would you say that it's uh, would you ever have like say counsel, not necessarily counsel, but like someone who's in a in a relationship who was they, they experience independent intimate partner violence during like, with them, and they're still in the relationship when you when you hear from them. So, uh, with with respect to research, um, you know, if I'm working in shelters, I think that the partner violence is going to be closer to them, and maybe they're still in the relationship or just out of it or something like that yeah. women who have tended to reach out to me you know outside of my research i mean and yeah, i think there's maybe one or two of them who then did yeah. you know like asked if they could participate and if i could i would say yes but yeah. Yeah. um but those tend to be more i mean i mean right off the top of my head i can think of women who have clearly left the relationship um, you know, un unfortunately, sometimes there's there's a, there's one woman who who let you know she's basically terminated the relationship itself. But if you have children with the abuser, then they can manage to continue to torment and and you know basically abuse you emotionally and psychologically and in other ways um, because of the shared custody um, that that goes on. Um, so so it, depending on your definition of abuse too. So yeah, that's true. Um, there's, there's potentially continued. And, and then if someone who's fled their partner, um, and basically had to like leave the state they were in or something like that to go somewhere else to hide, um, are they still being affected by, you know, the concern that maybe their partner will find them? So there's, you know, yeah, there's, there's different things that you can think about when we talk about if they're still in the relationship or still suffering the effects of that relationship, uh, in terms of things other than brain injury. Um, but I'd, I'd say it's been, um, it's been a mix. Um, it's definitely yeah. been a mix, but um, certainly when people are in crisis and they're, it's, you know, running, you know, leaving their partner with the clothes on their back and their kids and their kids' teddy bears yeah. And, and yeah. stuff, and they're in a shelter, I'm not going to want to do a study with them right then because I just don't think that's necessarily appropriate. Mm -hmm. Unless they're, you know, for some reason, yeah. really wanting, yeah. right? We want to take care of them first, make sure they're getting adjusted to the shelter and stuff. But, but um, for those who stay longer, then that's that's when we would usually interview them if if they're still interested. And then for this most recent study, I haven't really. It's been women who have been, I think, have been out of the relationship for for a while, um, for at least a little bit. And I know, unfortunately, you have a lot of experience in this, but are you, are you still 
they're actively doing research or talking to them in the shelters? Are... Um, I'm not. I mean, I mean, women. If if a woman is in the shelter, or we do have a couple of people yeah. who who have been in shelters who participate oh. in research. Okay. It's just the the other studies I had a connection, and that's just how it turned out that we okay. ended up getting a lot of folks from shelters coming in. And this time I'm advertising in, in a different way. Uh -huh. um, and, and, and in part, because I do, well, I, I, I don't exclude anybody. And I think it yeah. is important to continue to understand what's going on with the women who are in shelters. But the other thing that I want to understand is for women who have basically been separated from their abuser now for some time and are more settled down, are we still going to see persisting effects or persisting relationships between these negative outcomes and the previous brain injuries? Right. And because, I think that's a really important question. Yeah. So because I wanted to I wanted to ask you the reason I asked about this health thing is just I was wondering if you as a teacher, you've had obviously you've started on a professor, you had experience experience teaching about these issues, but uh you find you often teach or explain to women in the shelters or even or the authorities or the or the people who run the shelters, for example, in particular about about uh about about independent violence and traumatic injury. So what why why should I care about traumatic injury or why should I why do I think the women are have been assaulted or abused? So uh do, do you uh, do you, have you find that teaching a lot probably very big part of your research to explain yeah, what no. it is? No, no, I think that's it's I think it's critical. Yeah, no, you're you're right. I think it's for people who I mean now there are some groups now who actively their their basically job is to go out and train shelter workers and and frontline workers about brain injury, what it is and why it's relevant to what we're to, you know, if you're working with women who are experiencing partner moms. Because by and large, if you're working in a shelter or even police officers or even paramedics don't yeah. necessarily understand either what a brain injury is and or they don't put two and two together that, you know, that these women are sustaining brain injuries and they think, oh, this woman's hysterical or she's dizzy or she's, you know, all the things that you might see in a, in a woman who who may, may look close and cost they may just misattribute that to either drugs or hysteria or the psychological consequences versus oh yeah this actually yeah she was just slugged in the head with a baseball yeah. bat yeah. maybe it's a brain injury yeah that just was not a conversation that was being had before and now that's what part of part yeah i, I do see as part of my research to actively do that and i give lots of lectures where I try to help people to understand what a brain injury is, how easy it is to sustain one, and how when you have more than one, that's when we start to get in even more dangerous territory. And you know, if, if someone seems like she's just not working out, she's not yeah. doing what she's supposed to, well, if someone just has sustained a number of brain injuries, now she's in a new yeah. place, in a shelter. Yeah. Yeah. Now she has to get an order of protection. She has to find new school for her kids. She has to find a job. She has to look for a new place to live. I mean, that is going to be incredibly overwhelming for somebody who yeah. hasn't sustained brain injuries. Yeah. So if someone sustained a brain injury, I mean, they may come back with like nothing because they couldn't, they just sort of freeze, the, you know, executive functioning may yeah. be impaired and they just don't know even where to start. So learning how to work with women in a way that's sensitive to the fact that brain injury has occurred is incredibly important for women in at the front lines and, and all relevant stakeholders. Right, because so, I asked you about women and uh, and and environmental violence because I know environmental violence also includes males, but not as many. Obviously, not nearly as many. Um, so, but do I know there's been I've done a few pockets in this. There's been limited research, like as as in almost none compared to what should be like for athletes, for male athletes, but for MPA. So on female and females of range, you know, like pinky cousins, I know. Does a lot of great work in that area, but uh, what would you would you is that that's obviously an obvious document. So do you find it hard to explain to? I mean, I don't know. Or what would you say? Would you give an area that you think, if the that you think would be important for 
paramedics or for ER, for authorities even to recognize that this is a brain injury. Women suffer brain injuries more, and also this is this is this symptom is not necessarily one you'd see on the football field, but it'd be a important one to notice. Yeah, you talk, are you talking about a specific symptom? Yeah, um, well, yeah, symptoms, symptoms, but as yeah, I, I did say symptoms, but I meant symptoms. I guess like I'm more in general, more like kind of the uh, I don't know the word word. Yeah, no worries. No, and I and I think you know you've said a couple of things that I think are really important, and you mentioned pink concussions, and Catherine yeah. Slicker, the CEO yeah. there, is yeah. has been fabulous. And and yes. and if you go back, I mean, and you you sort of alluded to this as well, is that most of what we know about brain injuries is based on male data, yeah. male athletes or male military personnel. So these are like yeah. quote unquote healthier people to begin with. Yeah, exactly. So the majority of brain injury information healthy, yeah. we have does not apply to these. No. I mean, it might, we don't know if the, you know, it's, I'm going to say it's absolutely different, but there's, there's so much difference between what we know, you know, the, the populations that have been studied and what we know about brain injury from those populations and what we may see here, because these women are typically on the on the poor end of the spectrum. They're not getting treatment. They're in, enduring high stress. They may have other bodily injuries. So the, the whole host of things like what's important if you want yeah. to recover from a concussion? Well, you want to get it identified first, then you sort of taper back on activities. You make sure you don't sustain another. So these women are all on the negative end of that. So, yeah. so that's bad to begin with. And and we know, ver so so the, it's not just that they're women versus instead of men, but they also have a host of different circumstances, which make it bad as well. And they're more likely to have, you know, to, if, if you're in these horrible relationships, to be experiencing things that may be depression or, or anxiety or, or, or negative psychological outcomes that are related to the relationship, even if you haven't sustained a brain injury. So what's the interaction yeah. there, right? Because if you're, you know, a football player or, you know, in, in the, I mean, sure, in the military, you may have trauma and PTSD is very common there. Yeah. But certainly in athletics, you're not, you know, you know, you necessarily in these horrible relationships or horrible situations which would predispose you to being depressed or anxious or having PTSD. So there's a lot of differences between what we see and, and who's been studied and and who we're trying to look at here. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I, th I think that when I, I sort of t like to say, anytime we recognize someone who's experienced partner violence, we should entertain the idea that a brain injury may have occurred. And we should ask the right questions, ask if they've experience some alteration in consciousness from anything the partner did, you know, in that incident, if you're a paramedic or a police officer, ask if, you know, they have a, a memory gap for the, for, for what happened. So instead of assuming that they're on drugs or lying or whatever, when they say, I don't remember how I got from the bathroom to the bedroom, yeah, I think, no. oh, what happened right before that? Oh, well, he yeah. smashed my head against the mirror yeah. in the bathroom. Yeah. Oh, well, maybe you sustained a brain injury versus, okay, well, she can't remember what's going on. She doesn't have her story yeah. straight, so we're going to believe him. Yeah. The implications for interpreting what happened there are huge. And if you don't include traumatic brain injury or brain injuries from strangulation-related alterations in consciousness, you may have a completely misinterpretation of what's going on, and that's not going to go well for the women. No, so... um. And finally, I just wanted to ask you if you if you had to talk to who would you address the authorities and in general, so police, government officials, paramedics, whoever, and organizers of the shelters, what would you what would you impart to them about the importance of so of asking the right questions for for to find out if this person has had a brain injury, this this was woman or male, and to our just or a victim has had a brain injury caused by an independent partner violence. What, what kind of questions, what would you say to tell them to look out for? What kind of question to ask? Um, I mean, that's partly what I would say. What I have been doing, I mean, in some of this is find, you know, find out if, you know, I mean, you could ask it different ways, but I sort of, you could say, did your partner hit you in the head? But yeah. if you do that, it may or may not be a brain injury. But if you yeah. say after your partner did something, you know, after something happened tonight, did you lose consciousness? Yeah. And if they say yes, then and it was from some blunt force trauma or they say, yeah, well, he was 
choking me, strangulation, yeah. then yeah. you can say, okay, well, yeah, that may very well be. That's that sounds like a brain injury to me. You don't know whether or not you want to tell her that there's somebody at the very least you know that information. Or if if you know you, you say, Well, you well, were you really confused after something he did? Were you a dazed or disoriented? And and she says, Yeah, yeah. And then I said, well, what happened right before that? Well, he threw me down the stairs. I hit my head a couple of times and I was really, I got up and I didn't really know what was going on. I couldn't remember, you know, where he was or what we were doing at that moment. I was really out of it for a while. Well, then that would sound like a brain injury to me. Yeah. If it's sort of like, well, I lost consciousness or I was confused, but it was because she was, you know, she says, well, you know, she was drinking or he forced her to, sometimes they force women to do drugs or drink or whatever, you know, that's not necessarily a brain injury. So that's something different, but I sort of try to work backwards. And, 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 and if we see a set, you know, what the, the sign or symptom of a brain injury, and then we find out that right before that she was either hit in the head or had her head against something, et cetera, or was strangled, then I would say, okay, this is really indicative of a brain injury. And so we need to operate in that fashion. And hopefully the more murvish or female brain injuries in general will provide you with more data, more information you can tell these authorities and people in charge. But I guess finally, I just want to ask you just, because you're a best year professor of psychiatry and you're a psychology PhD. So uh, PTSD, does that... Have you found anything? Have you did first of all? Have you counseled many people with PTSD? And how would you would you say there's much difference in PTSD? Though PTSD, if say a military or versus a a PIPV incident, would you say there's? I mean, see there is because there's by recall. I don't know if that's true. I've seen movies that recall to like the incident, but uh, is there much difference in the effects of? Is there is there a discernible difference? I guess. I mean, the effects of it? So, and I, I, if I understand your question, I mean, yeah, that, I'm not no, 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 rambling here. Oh, no, no, no. No, it's fine. It's a, it's a, I think it's a tough question to ask. And yes. um, in terms of PTSD, that is, I, I think that is a, a bit of a tricky one because women may be sustaining or experiencing PTSD because of the psychological trauma and the true threat to their lives and the threat to physical integrity. Okay. And not, so not, directly could, from, not directly from the injury, from the brain injury, yeah. necessarily. It could just be because, you know, so they're, so they're being traumatized. I mean, there's, yeah. there's coercive control, which, you know, which is, which is horrible too. So there's women who you don't even need to be, some some partners have their women so basically terrify the women so much basically they threaten them all they have to do is make that look and the woman will yeah. kind of do what they're supposed to do because they're yeah. so afraid once you get to that position where and and, and women know they can be murdered yeah. by their partners and so you don't ever actually have to lay a hand on them and so is that a brain injury no but is it ptsd yes yeah. and when we come to the the effects of brain injury and we look at those and we look at the effects of PTSD, a lot of them are overlapping. So many yeah. of these women have both. And can we really disentangle them? No, no. but does it really matter? I don't think yeah, so. But no. what I try to do in my work is to try to find out if we can see independent effects of the brain injuries and their level of PTSD versus the psychological or versus, you know, just the, the abuse severity, I should say. Right. And I have been able to look at that. And when we control for the abuse severity, we can still see relationships between the brain injuries and PTSD. So is it a different type of PTSD? Not, I, I don't know that because I haven't compared PTSD for these women versus PTSD in um, men or other or, or folks in other types of traumatic situations. Yeah. Um, but we do see a relationship between the abuse severity and PTSD, as well as relationships between brain injuries and PTSD. So it ends up being a more complex picture, right. um, or, or at least the contributing factors are not just one or the other. Yeah, because I was going to say that's, I kind of goes, goes again to the, as we start off with the uh, the stigma, the whole thing is different to difficulty and like any sort of clarity because of the complexity 
and there's stigma on top of all that. So for brain gene and for density and for IV density balance, there's the stigma of just all of that, and then also the complexity of of different different unique unique symptoms and outcomes for different people. So it's I mean it's just people are just tired to don't want to don't want to bother don't want to not bother to say that, but don't want to get tired to think about it. So we would only want to press on more. But uh, would you would you the last last office I promise the last question not really not really a question more of a statement to expand on, but um, what would you how would you address Women and uh, and also women, women or any any other victims of IP, any victims of IV, IPV and violence um, to to look out for for if they I mean obviously they should get the help get help that they need as right away but I mean but for brain addiction people people hold hold not only the thing was not only on them but say the paramedics or doctors or policemen. Or just as your shelter organizers, shelter organizers. So they should look for in these women, these people who come in. They should look for look signs of brain injury. But what would you say? How would how would you, how should they do that? Given that these women are just obviously coming in from a very traumatic experience. I mean, I I, I think just again, I I sort of. I would make that given the high numbers of brain injuries that have found the the high prevalence of brain injuries in women who have experienced partner violence. Yeah, I would I would just say let's I mean we're not going to assume it hasn't operated. Let's just say we want to assume that it's very possible that a brain injury has occurred, and then ask about things that may suggest that a brain injury has occurred. If they've lost consciousness, if they're disoriented or have memory loss. And then, you know, try to find out if it was because they're, they had some blunt force trauma to the head or if they had strangulation. And I think just doing that bit would go a long way in understanding what they're really, what, what's really going on. If you just ask if you had a brain injury, that's yeah. probably not going to get what, what we want. Uh, people don't necessarily understand that. Uh, um, but if we do ask these other questions, I think that gets us closer to understanding um, what what happened. Well, thank you, thank you so much for doing this podcast, and I hope that this message you have to get there. Even though I'm, I kind of stumble to my words a bit, but uh, but but uh, the East Board Doctor Allaire's words can get out there and hopefully reduce some of the stigma that's surrounding IPV and traumatic brain injury and all and together all of it. So and uh, being and female brain injury needs you study more, and I know you're. You have worked with, or you you're on the board of the of the pink concussions. So, is there anything you would like to say about just your word reach? You have to find more more of your more of your research, obviously, at the Harvard site. But uh, is there any place you could best where you or the research you want to say you want to showcase that other people are yours? Um, I mean, uh, well, there's now there's a group. I mean, I think I think. Um, I, I definitely always like to give lots of credit to Catherine Sinatra at Pink Concussions. I think she's yeah. been amazing. And then there's the Partner Inflicted Brain Injury Task Force, which meets once a month, um, where anyone can join that. And we talk about either IPV or, you know, we, we sort of blend. Do you blend do that, is, that, is that online? It's it's a Zoom meeting that happens every Tuesday, the last Tuesday of the month at two o'clock Eastern time. And, and anyone can join. At pink concussions, or how yep. how women find this? How's so this? I think if you I should know the website, but I, my think if you were to Google pink concussions, and then you'd see the PIBI task force. PIBI stands for Partner Inflicted Brain Injury, so P I B I. Okay. And I think all you have to do is is uh, send Catherine an email, and then she'll you'll get on a list where they where she will send you the time and information of the meetings and who's going to be the guest speaker at that meeting. And so that's a, it's a, a nice way to learn about I, what's going I, on. I will definitely include that in the link and include it in the in description of the podcast, but as I continue. Yeah. So, so that would be great. Um, and I mean, there are other people in the field who are doing great things. There's um, a couple of online resources um, for out of Canada, the ABI toolkit, which I think you, you spoke to, with yeah. 
I think you spoke with Lynn, um, Lynn Hogg and Andy yeah. McCullen. So you probably already know yeah. about that. Yeah. So that's great. Yeah. Um, and then um, there's um, Rachel Ramirez and um, Juliana Nemeth out in Ohio with the OVD, o ODV, oh, Ohio Domestic Violence Network, ODVN. Um, and so they're doing really fabulous work as well. And Rachel is, she always says, oh, I leave that to you researchers. Um, yeah. She does, she does do some work with, with Juliana, um, but she's really on the front lines out there actively training people every day about IPV and brain injury. Um, and another group over on the other side of Canada with uh, Paul Van Donkler and Karen the, Mason. The SOAR project, yeah. The SOAR project, yes. Yeah, this there on yeah. the August I did a few years ago. Yeah. Well, two years ago, or a year ago. Yeah. So those, it. yeah, I mean, those are some of the, I, I think they have some great resources and some of the people in the field who've been around for a little bit. Um, you think Kathy Monahan actually in New York, she has done one of the first papers on, on IPV and TBI actually, and uh -huh. she's still she's still doing some work. So there's, there's, there's some good work out there and it's actively growing. Um, and, um, yeah, it's just, it's super exciting to see this super tiny, tiny or non-existing field. Yeah. It should be start, very, very, start easy. to flourish. Yeah. It should be very popular, very not popular, but very studied and very common, but unfortunately it's not, but, uh, but, you you and I understood like and and, and the many people across North America and I'm sure across the world have uh, been doing this sort of great research that we need to highlight. So uh, thank you so much. And uh where can people see if they want to re find out more about your your specific research? Go to your Harvard site. So um yeah, so I do have I have a website. Um and it's um I should know what it is, www.martinos.org. Um, but I, yeah, if you could post that next to the thing, yeah. I'll, I'll figure out what it is. I'm, I'm, I'm horrible. I remember. Those no, no, no worry. No, but I suppose it's always weird. All the way. HTTPS colon, yeah. backslash, backslash colon. It's like, what the, so, no, but and I will definitely, definitely link that for you. And uh, I will link. And there's also, and one other resource would be um, the Enigma group, which has an, which has a, a IPV and TBI task force. Um, so that they're they're trying to bring together people everywhere and information everywhere so that, um, you know, like just to sort of have like a central warehouse, so to speak, of people right. who can chat and stuff. So that's another another pretty good resource. Right. Well, I will definitely you know, have like, to work cut out for me. Now. I got the Enigma. They're out of there. It doesn't matter. Enigma group. And uh, and plus, you know, the, 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 the sort of the EBI tool get. And uh, your website and thinking of questions, the Frank uh, Ranty JVV we monthly group talk. So I will definitely research all that. And uh, thank you so much for being on this this podcast. And uh, yes, so and thank you everyone for listening. And I hope you've learned a lot. And I uh, hope you research if you if you don't know, hope you don't hope don't hope you find the sites, but hope you. The sites are available. Let's just say that the sites are available for anyone who thinks they may need them. So, or if you want to, if you just want to, I think you think it's important for anybody else to just read them and find out what's going on there and find out, teach themselves more about the situation in general. So, uh, but you know that you think you personally need it or not. So, yes. Yeah, so, um, hopefully, and hopefully, you all you all check those out. And uh, otherwise, we will talk to you again next week. With uh, next week will be Isabel Gutierrez. But for now, thank you so much, Dr. Thanks Flora. So much. Thanks so much for having me. Take care. Thanks.